All right, I believe we're ready to go. And I want to thank the Seattle Science Foundation for the opportunity for me to come and be able to present. I have uh, Dr. David Davis with me, who's one of the fellows here at uh, Swedish, and he's going to help me demonstrate a prone lateral position patient using robotic assistance. And there's a couple things that I want to kind of drive home before we even start here is that robotic assistance is a very powerful tool that when used correctly can add to efficiency, accuracy, and reproducibility. But just like any other tool, it needs to be used correctly. And I like to refer often to the robot as a sixth sense that we can use interoperatively, but keep in mind that this sixth sense doesn't replace common sense. It doesn't replace the surgeon's burden in participating in the surgery and doing it correctly. And nor should it be used blindly without a good understanding of the way that the tool works itself. So we're going to go ahead and work our way through this tool, we'll work our way through the approach to the patient for a prone lateral positioned case, and the way that we can utilize this tool to increase our efficiency, accuracy, and reprodu reproducibility, keeping in mind that the surgeon is still in charge, and that we use the robot as that sixth sense not to replace our other five senses, and perhaps most importantly, common sense. So I began using robotic assistance uh, in about 2005. Um, at that time, the user interface was an Israeli engineer. And uh, when, that patient, or when that person would tell me that we were ready for a right-sided L3 pedicle screw, uh, you either sort of blindly trusted that individual or you did not. And you would proceed with the case depending on how you thought the fidelity of the registration was. I would tell you that one of the potential drawbacks of modern robotic-assisted technology is the user interface is such that it's very compelling. And so when we look at this user interface, as you can see on the screen now, we get this very, uh, what we believe to be an accurate representation of what's going on live within the surgery. And that's where it becomes important to understand that tool and realize that in this case, for example, we, our workflow was a preoperative CT scan, and then our interoperative registration was with 2D imaging. And that's not to say that there can't be some abnormalities in that registration, though we've become fairly good at segmentalizing the vertebral bodies and working our way through those problems. Another potential workflow is interoperative 3D imaging. And I use both of these workflows in my practice, and I find them to be very accurate as long as we understand the tools and potential pitfalls associated with that. But all that being said, I want to go ahead and get into the case. And I want to talk about the basic precepts of the workflow itself. And so, as has been previously mentioned in our talks today about using navigation, it's important to understand how navigation works and how we're going to utilize that workflow. And again, starting in a way that we're working far away from the patient registration and working towards that registration, which if you can see on our uh, cadaver here, we have pelvic-based registration. Um, if we can bring the camera up a little bit, we're, we're looking at the lateral projection right there on the cadaver. Is there any way we can look at the back? We'll see, hopefully we can see some of this. You can see this is, this is the back of the spine. I'm gonna to try to show it in a way that can be seen on the camera here. This is the lateral projection here. And so these are the pelvic base recognition markers. And again, um, the fidelity of our navigation is dependent on the machine's ability to see the pelvic base recognition markers throughout the case. And this particular platform adds a certain degree of security in the sense that we have a second fiducial here. This is our surveillance marker on the right PSIS, whereas what we uh, call the DRB, or the primary reference array, is in the left PSIS. And what the surveillance marker does, it does not participate in the actual uh, uh, mechanics of, of navigation, but what it monitors consistently is the distance from that primary reference array. And if for any reason I either knock the primary reference array or I knock the surveillance marker, then we'll get a warning on the screen saying that something has moved and we need to immediately question then the integrity of our registration and we need to rethink things. Uh, as we go through this case, we'll see many ways to sort of uh, check that and uh, check it again so that we, uh, again, cause no harm to the patient and we use this sixth sense in the most intelligent way we possibly can. So let's go ahead and jump into the case. I always like to, as far as workflow is concerned, I like to start with the parts of the case that require the most accuracy and then move to the portions of the case that require somewhat less accuracy. And so I believe that Pedicle screw placement, for example, is a game of fractions of a millimeter. So it's important that we have the best navigational integrity as we place our pedicle screws. As we go into placing our inner bodies in the uh, prone or lateral position, 
that is a game of fractions of a centimeter. And so it's okay if we're half a centimeter anterior or half a centimeter posterior, assuming that the neural elements in the disk space can handle those things. So in this particular case, I'm gonna start with that element of the server that requires the most uh, navigational integrity, which will be the pedicle screw placement. After I've done my two-dimensional uh, uh, registration, I move fluoroscopy out of the way. I only use it again if I've run into problems and I'm trying to, again, assess the fidelity of the navigation. But what I like to do is go ahead and use the robotic arm itself to help plan our incision. And in this case, we have planned an L2 to 5 prone lateral approach. We'll probably just do portions of this so that we can leave part of the cadaver available for the workshop this afternoon. But I'll go ahead and through the end effector, I'll go ahead and mark right where that L5 screw should be placed. And then I immediately go to my L2 screw and the robotic arm will reorient. And you can see actually as it moves up on the user interface over the L2 screw to be coaxial, moves on down, and I've planned my screws so that it's gonna be in line from L2 to L5 all the way down. And I can go ahead and mark on the skin where I'm gonna go ahead and have my L2 screw. We'll have Dr. Davis come in here and make our incision between L2, 5. So this is a paramedian incision. Typically, I will carry this incision just down to the fascia itself clean off the fascia bilaterally. What I hope to avoid with any robotic case is unilateral uh, pulling on the skin, which can, again, affect the relationship of, say, the L2 vertebral body to the pelvis. And by planning my incision through the robotic assistance, then I can avoid retraction altogether. And so we're already in place here with our L2 screw ready to go. We're gonna use a special knife that has been uh, engineered to work through the end effector. Throughout the case, I can go ahead and look at certain tells on the uh, screen itself, and I'm looking at that offset meter. If I push on this, you can see that my offset goes up higher. Um, you can also see that there's a force meter that tells me that I may be off. And in this case, my offset is perfect. I'm gonna go ahead and just write through the incision that Dr. Davis made for us. I'm gonna dive down to bone. I'll usually do three cuts, just rotating this approximately 120 degrees with each cut. And that allows me to have a clear access without soft tissue in the way all the way to the bone. After I've taken the knife out, I'm gonna look again at the offset meter. If I need to micro adjust, I can just by stepping on the table, uh, on the pedal, which in this case we do not. And this is my first check to again, look at the anatomy and make sure that everything is lined up. So I'm gonna go ahead and bounce off bone and make sure that my navigational integrity is such that as I'm hitting that bone, I get the haptic feedback that I would expect from hitting the bone. And then I'm gonna use this instrument in such a way that I use high speed and low pressure. And I'm waiting for that pitch change as I enter the bone. And again, that's another check that I'm in the right position and that our navigational integrity is good. This particular screw system that I'm using is a self-drilling, self-tapping screw system. So after I've created that entry hole, I can just immediately go to my screw through the soft tissue pathway that I've uh, created. And I'm gonna go ahead and just put it down here. You can do some steering on the way down, but for the most part, I like to avoid putting any force across the end effector, and I believe, again, in high speed, low pressure. And then normally, if this were a, a patient, I would stimulate this screw, and we'd look for any electrodiagnostic evidence of breach. Once we've placed our screw, then we can go ahead and move on to the next screw. And so we'll just select our left-sided L3 screw, and we'll move on down and repeat the steps. We'll have Dr. Davis come on in here and put in the left L3 screw. So just go ahead and step on the pedal there. And just wait it'll, uh, in, in, until the robotic arm stops moving. And it'll give you a green box, letting you know that it's the appropriate height. So just let it go a little bit further. There mm -hmm. we go. Our offset meter is right where we would like it to be. So he's gonna go ahead and stab. Rotate 120 degrees, stab again. Rotate 120 degrees, stab again. And then we're ready for the high-speed burr. And again, we're gonna use high-speed, low pressure. He's using his left hand to keep the fiducials oriented towards the infrared camera. And just bounce off bone and just make sure that our interface, so you can see you're pushing a little bit harder there and you're getting a little bit of sky as you're coming in off that surface. So just back up a little bit off the bone, high speed, low pressure, and let the tool do the work. Good. All right, and as soon as that bottoms out, you'll remove that, and then we can go straight to our next screw. No drill. 
And again, same principle applies here. High speed, low pressure with screw placement, where I get very nervous is when I see a surgeon raise their elbow up and start pushing down on the uh, patient or otherwise, that will uh, stimulate scythe and uh, other potential issues. Using the rigid robotic arm as our uh, screw guide is uh, typically enough to get the trajectory that we need. And if we're having to push too hard, we haven't prepared the track for the screw quite as well. And so again, now we selected the left L4 screw. We'll place one more screw here and then we'll jump ahead to the uh, prone lateral. Um, and as far as patient selection is concerned, there are three factors that I figure in as far as, as, as should I be doing a single position prone lateral or really any single position case. Part of those is surgeon factors, so it's my level of comfort associated with that position with whatever the pathology might be. The other thing that I think about are the institutional factors, and we've spent a lot of time actually studying turnover times in different institutions, and the institution I work in happens to be incredibly efficient, which we're very lucky in. Um, but in our current institution, it takes about 10 minutes to, to, to change a patient from, say, a lateral position to a prone position. And so uh, I like to think that we don't all, uh, always let technology trump common sense. And if for that patient, two positions is more appropriate at our institution, where it only takes about 10 minutes to reposition that patient, then uh, I take that into consideration. Whereas other institutions that I'm familiar with may take over an hour. And so that has to figure in there because time under anesthesia is, uh, you know, more invasiveness for the patient. And then the third thing uh, that I take into account is the patient characteristics and the type of pathology. And so recognizing as we look at different psoas anatomies and different pelvic crest anatomies, et cetera, is it the appropriate patient for this type of approach? So we've placed our screws from L2 to L3. I'm gonna go ahead and just stop there, or L2 to L4. Stop there even though we've select, uh, planned for L5. This will give us a couple uh, levels that we can use later if people wanna come and use the robotic technology. And we're gonna go ahead and move to the prone portion of the, or the, the lateral portion of this uh, prone positioning. And uh, we're on a positioner that you can't see the anatomy very well. Do we have my slide? I do have one single slide that uh, shows the position of a patient that we did just this last week. If we're able to pull that up, great, if not. But the anatomy of the positioner is such that this is a positioner that uh, provides good control over the chest and the pelvis. And then we have a, uh, uh, on the contralateral side of where we're working, we've got a block that'll help us uh, still be able to introduce things laterally without the patient sliding uh, one way or another. And this also allows us to, to break the bed open if we need to or not. And there are pros and cons to breaking the bed. Um, if I'm approaching the L3-4 segment, often I find that I don't necessarily need to break the bed. And the disadvantage to breaking the bed in that case is it actually brings the lateral skin further away. And so you can see on this positioner, and it's not demonstrating well on the, the right-hand side, so I apologize for that. But there we go. And where you can see the contralateral bolster, and then in this case, we we're approaching this patient through the right-hand side. I did not really break the bed in this particular case. And you can see I used intraoperative fluoroscopy at the start of the case to mark my proposed incision for the level that we we're working on in this particular patient. I just do that to make sure that I don't have anything blocking my radiography that I'm gonna be utilizing in the case, even though I'm using the robot for the, for the primary portions of the case. And then similar to what was mentioned, we have a different mode on the uh, robot now. And uh, we'll go ahead and start at L23, again, with the, uh, with the idea that we want to work far away from the reference arrays and work towards them. As soon as I place my inner body at L23, I'm going to change the relationship of the L2 vertebral body to the pelvic recognition markers. And that's OK. We're referencing off of L3 using the robotic software as we're doing this. And so then as I progress towards L3-4, I haven't changed the relationship of the L3-4 disk space to the reference markers if I've only done my L2-3 uh, uh, procedure. And so in this case, I've already pre-marked where these incisions are about, but the way I pre-marked these incisions was not using intraoperative fluoroscopy. I went ahead and selected and I used uh, my first dilator, which can be navigated and I can go ahead and put that in, and you can see that this lines up fairly well with the L2-3 segment. And this saves me a lot of fluoroscopic time in the sense that I can get right to the midline of that disk space, and that I can uh, align my initial incision right in line with the disk space. And so go ahead, we'll go ahead and make our skin incision. And I carry this down to the fascia, and then typically we'll bluntly dissect through the fascia. I use a peon. 
And uh, with that peon, I, I separate the three levels of the fascia in line with the muscle striations so that I can get into that retroperitoneal space. And then apropos of our first discussion today, once I'm in the retroperitoneal space, and while we're doing this, I'm gonna go ahead and bring the table up a little bit as well. So even with robotic assistance, in this case, I'm getting in with my finger. And the positioner itself is uh, already tilted 15 degrees. So if you look at our, our table here, um, for, the table to, for the patient to be laying level, we need to bring the, the patient 15 degrees in my direction. Um, that can be a little bit uh, discombobulating for the anesthesia staff sometimes, and a lot of times we'll actually also cant the, the head pillow so that that's sitting at 15 degrees as well. But on a standard trios table, you can actually move the table away from you about 26 degrees. If you add the 26 and 15, you get about 41 degrees. That helps with the ergonomics of the case so that when I bring this to the appropriate height, which will come up a little bit higher, and then I'll go ahead and move the table away from me. And in a normal case, I'd be a little bit taller than this, but this allows through my normal height and my normal ergonomics, to just go ahead and look exactly at the wound that I'm work, uh, working at. And right now, my index finger has come along the posterior aspect of the retroperitoneal. I've swept all of the other uh, intra or retroperitoneal structures anteriorly, and I've created a pathway with my finger, and I'll, I'll introduce the first dilator directly over my finger to that lateral portion of the disc space, and then I can look exactly and get this positioned exactly where I want it, to be in the optimal position to drop my K-wire in. So I'm gonna keep it right here, and I'll ask Dr. Davis to place our K-wire. Just right in that hole, yep. Just a mallet. And this sets our first dilator without having to use any fluoroscopy at all to verify that we're at the correct place. And you can see maybe we ended up a little bit anterior there. We can rectify that situation. That's fine, and we're gonna leave it. Um, with our uh, retractor, because our retractor system allows us to individually act, uh, uh, move the blades either posteriorly or anteriorly. I'll place my second dilator, and this will be the dilator that I can then also stimulate, and I can work with my neuromonitor to make sure that the lumbosacral plexus is posterior to my dilator system. And then we're going to go ahead and put our retractor. We've got... Uh, yeah, I've got 130 blades here. I'm actually measuring about 100 on the skin, so we'll be working through slightly longer blades, which is fine. And he's going to go ahead and hook up the retractor. Let's go ahead and get that uh, navigation fiducial again that I had on that first uh, navigator. Yep, and so the advantage of this is I can then, before I set my retractor, I can go ahead and place the navigation array back onto that first dilator. And... And I can align my case to be fairly perfectly across the disk space before I set the retractor. So let's go ahead and uh, now tighten the retractor arm. And again, because I know that I'm slightly anterior with my placement of the pin, as I'm opening up my retractor arms, I'm going to bias the retractor posteriorly. And then I actually, as I remove my dilators, like to keep the pin in place so that it ends up within my dissection field where I expect it to be. And do we have the light source for the... Uh, yeah. yeah, it's right here. So this portion of the case becomes mini open in which I'm using my five senses again, combined with the sixth sense of the robotic assistance or the intraoperative navigation to see what I need to see to per successfully perform this procedure. And if the uh, K-wire is not exactly where I expect it to be at this time, I've got no problem just loosening the retractor a little bit and adjusting it. But I will usually use an endoscopic kitner at this point. I'm going to give you this back. And I will sweep all the soft tissues out of the way. And then I will use a ball tip neural probe. And I will verify that we do not have any neurologic structures within the field that I'm working. And once that's verified, I usually, I'll get my 15 blade. So if you can go ahead and give me the 15 blade. Uh, no, I'm sorry, the, uh, for the lateral. There we go, perfect, thank you. 
and use my 15 blade and under direct visualization with all the soft tissues cleared out of the way, go ahead and make my annulotomy so that I can begin my work and do my lateral. And so again, I'm doing all this under direct visualization, just like I would on a normal mm -hmm. case. I've just used the navigation to okay. make sure that I get to the correct location. Roland. Once, yes. Uh, we questioning here. Um, when you put that wire, you cannot see that wire on the navigation. How do you know where that wire end up? The the Did wire you goes. Take a or something to check what is the wire doing. The wire goes through the first dilator, so I can see the first dilator on the navigation. But the yeah. tip, the tip of the wire, where is it? Yeah, it, it, so the wire is going to be introduced through that first dilator, and I'm assuming that then it, it goes directly into the disk space based on where I've placed that first dilator. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, I just, uh, you know, we were discussing in here that, uh, um, you know, usually when you do a fully navigated, you, you have these uh, blind corners, and this is one of them, you know, because. Um, um, can you do it? You know, I've seen it. Do, when I do the navigation, it's actually the first dilator is actually a, um, it has a tip that is almost sharp, but it's blunt. And I go through it and I use it as a, as a wire at the same time, you know? So right. that way I know where is it, you know? I can control the, the, the tip. Yeah? I, um, I think it's what? Metronic, the one that has it, yeah? Um, that you can aim the no, wire. No, you, you see it, yeah. The first dilator is actually a, a, a straightforward tool yeah, you put, that you, you put see the first it all dilator the time. In. My problem with using the first dilator to do that, or the K-wire, is once you put that dilator in the disk space, it doesn't sit there as, as well. And yeah. then every dilator you go back to can dive into the disk space someplace. Yeah, yeah. But no, I, I do the same exact thing. I put the dilator because then I know exactly where it is, and I can put the array back on it right away and find out. Yeah. yeah. No, at one point, we designed exactly that. I hated the guide wire for the same reason. It would either migrate or go through or be really flimsy. So we created this dilator that has a little smaller tip. So what I'll do is place it on the disc and mallet it. Just mallet exactly. it right through the disc. So you know exactly where it's going. That goes in the disc and pass all the other dilators over. Yeah, because the, 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 yeah, because, uh, um, uh, the, the wires, yeah, and that's right. The problem with the wires, also the, wire, the wires are very flexible and like clumsy. And if for some reason you hit a little bit of a uh, hard surface, they deflect and it can go anterior right. and you can hit a vessel, you know? The wires can bend very easily and you don't see it on the navigation, which right. I think is a, is a blind thing. And I'm not sure. Um, what do you think about these? Um, yeah. That's where the, the haptic feedback is very important for me in the sense that uh, I've got a good feeling of what the wire feels like going into the disk space, as does my assistant that I work with. And if we do not have that feeling, for example, if we're meeting any resistance at all, we stop. So I wouldn't uh, continue to advance it into the disk space. But in this case, the advantage of the navigation is that I know that I'm kind of center on the, the, the cranial caudal portion of the disk space and can fall down inside. So I haven't had uh, any problems with uh, the wires ending up in the wrong location. Um, but I, that's why we rely on the experience of the people that are gathered here. Uh, it's good to get this type of knowledge, et cetera, et cetera. But I do not typically move x-ray in to see where the wire goes. Hey, Corey, Corey. Corey. Oh, Corey. Corey. I, I was just going to ask, do you routinely use any sort of intradiscal shim to protect the nerve from creeping under the posterior blade? Yeah, and that's a very good question. Um, I think the majority of uh, folks that are especially doing non-navigated uh, uh, prone laterals would advocate the use of the shim. Uh, I typically do not, and uh, the reason for that is I you know, get a little bit concerned about shim placement. Um, obviously, we've uh, studied to the point that we can utilize this shim uh, in such a way that we can place it very safely. My main rationale is, again, that I can utilize the uh, advantage of the navigation itself as a reference as to where I'm at. And so if there's any, uh, 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 if, if the migration of the retractor occurs, um, I'm able to check that with the intraoperative navigation but where I'm do, seeing do you, the mini Do you navigate the retractor, Roland? I, mean, I did navigate the retractor into place, yes. So you see it on there, the posterior blade, where it's at? Uh, no, so I knew where the, uh, the K-wire was based on where I had uh, navigated that first uh, dilator. And then I, I retract posteriorly from that. Yeah, but once you, once you take the dilators, you're all again yeah. by the wind, you know? If, they, if, they, if, if it moves anterior, the navigation will not tell you that navigation, the, the retractor move anterior. You yeah, have to use like common sense, look for the slope or something. That's correct? Not, if, if not we, only, the other reason to use the shim is not only is the problem of the retractor navigating anterior, no, no, but it 
pulls out too. Right. If using navigation, exactly. you have no way of telling that. I actually, to tell you the truth, I've actually gone more frequently, and I don't know, you were talking about the K-wire. If I feel resistance and I'm not sure where I'm at, I just put the K-wire into the bone, yeah. and then I leave it down there, and then I go and find the disk space. I, I, <laughs> okay. I completely agree. If people spend too much time trying to localize the disk. If you're next to the end plate, what does it matter? It's a guide to your dilator. That's all it is. Yep. And so where I get to, to reestablish whether there's been any creep of the retractor now is as I combine what I'm looking at through my mini open and what I see on the surface as I enter here. And so I'm able to now access the disk space and know that I've remained collinear with the original uh, approach and that the, 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 dial, the uh, uh, device itself has not migrated anteriorly. And so again, now I'm able to see exactly where the cob is in reference to the spine, and I'm able to bring that down in and approach across, and I apologize. And as we enter the disk space again, I'm not neglecting the normal haptics that I would expect to Scary. feel as I enter that disk space. And I can bring it across, and again, we're referencing off of the so L3 do. vertebral body. So as I increase the height of the L2 segment in the L2-3 disk space, it's going to appear as if some of the instruments may invade that L2 surface. But again, I am uh, relying on my haptic feedback as I go through. We're right at the far annulus. Yeah, but for, for example, right through. there, you look your anterior row, correct? Now, if, if you see where I've uh, planned, I'm, I'm right in line with the cage there. You, you know what works pretty well for that, too, is I put a ghost pedicle screw in the disk space at the same angle that I know I want to get in the middle of the disk space, and then I follow along with it the whole time. Right. It's in this case, we have that same uh, reproduction of the uh, planned implant. And so, uh, again, as I lock this up, now I've moved this to the other direction so that we're cutting downward now. You can, this is actually the, the representation of my cage. So if I go back to my plan, I can actually see that cage that I've placed in there. And there are different representations, different uh, ways that you can look at this so that you can either see more or less of the cage. Oops. And so this way, for example, shows me exactly where I am according to my plan. Right? So that I can adjust either anterior or posterior, and I can come on through. And unfortunately, you're not seeing the, the far right side of this image. But again, I'm through my annulus, and then I'm able to come back out. So again, I haven't found as much of a need for the shim because I can keep figuring out where I'm at anterior to posterior through one, looking into the wound, and then two, yeah, utilizing my navigated yeah, instruments. But, but, but what about, for example, you stay there, the retractor goes a little superficial, and the, and, the, and the femoral nerve comes into the field. You have to only see it with your eyes, correct? Correct, yep, and that's why this is a mini open case. Again, it doesn't replace my common sense or my other senses as a surgeon. I am usually only using the navigation to navigate across the disk space. Everything that I'm doing outside of the disk space, I am uh -huh. uh, visualizing. Yeah, because we, we normally we use the sh I use, sometimes use the shim not just to keep the retractor in place. It's, it's a physical barrier yep. to the femoral nerve not to come into the field, as Corey mentioned. Yep, and I, I think that's a very good utilization for it, especially in the prone lateral. Can I, can I just make a comment? Yes, my, please. I know it's often common, and everyone talks about passing the cob through the annulus. I would seriously caution everybody, please do not. You do not need to go through the annulus on the opposite side. Um, this is a live, so I'm going to stop at that. I'm happy to discuss this offline. There's no reason to go through it. You can go up to the lateral wall of the pedicle and slowly dilate the opposite annulus. One more time, please take caution going through the annulus on the opposite side. Neil, are you? Uh, on your deformity cases, typically working for the concavity or the convexity? Always left side. Always, always, left always, side. always. So do you change uh, that okay. if you are uh, on I'll the... I'll qualify that. We go pre-service. Right yeah. uh, one more time, okay. qualify it. I go pre-service all the time. You don't want to go pre-service well, on, on the, the right. IBC yeah. side. Yeah, it makes sense. Want to be it it makes sense side. for pre-service, absolutely. So always left, pre-service, always. Yeah, but it's very interesting, Neil, because I do trans and but when I look at my cases, I actually do more right than left, believe it or not. And I pick it up based on how the psoas looks in the MRI, I think. But 
And also in the formula phone. Very interesting. Oh, what about you guys? Uh, the Transoas guys. I think it's four or five to start with. I would, I would make a very important note in scoliosis patients, if you're doing it prone, look at the rotation of the vertebra. Because if you have it and you are coming in on the side that it's rotated away from, you're gonna feel like you're coming in through the umbilicus right. yeah. because it's so rotated away from you. Yeah. So studying your anatomy ahead of time on the axial rotation and the axial MRI will help you. So you come in from the side where your distance is because that is a shortcoming of prone in general is you have a longer distance for your retractor blades, and it'll only make it even longer if you come in on the wrong side. Right, that's interesting. And that brings up a, a couple of important points, keeping in mind when you're looking at prone lateral that frequently your retractor blade length is gonna be about two centimeters longer than it would be in a, uh, a lateral position type surgery. Um, you know, in regards to the deformity cases, I actually always come in through the convexity just because if we keep in mind that scoliosis is also a rotational deformity, the convexity presents itself to be more posterior. And again, back to the comment that was just made, we don't really want to be coming in through uh, the more ventral surface of the abdomen and through the umbilicus, et cetera, uh, coming in from that side. But to that end, in, in my hands, I find it uh, completely necessary to release the contralateral annulus so that I can correct the deformity because I'm working through the contralateral convexity towards the concavity. And so that's why I, I think it's an important part of my deformity side. correction to release that annulus. Yeah. Ronald, yes. <laughs> never ever done it in 20 years. Release the contralateral annulus. Yeah. And I've seen your pictures as well, Neil. Like I say, you're, you're a master uh, at this I, stuff. I, so. Donald, I do it all the time, so no worry. We always yeah, do it. Can I, can I clarify? And this is the excitement of coming together in these fora, right, is that we have the opportunity to discuss you're releasing it. You're releasing it. You're just doing a gradual release, right? You're stretching and dilating it. You have to release. You have to release, Neil. You yeah. don't have to go through it. That's all I'm saying. Yep. Yeah, of course you yeah, have You have to, to release contralateral. Otherwise, you will never correct the four And, and in the patients. Cages will go everywhere. Something wrong. And in patients oh, that I'm concerned, I'm sure you just you just like a delicate guy. In patients that I'm concerned just, about the contralateral anatomy, you don't have to cut it. Yeah. You just stretch it out. That's all. Yeah. It, that's right. all it is. Yeah, and uh, and I, I think that's a good point. Through. In the patients I'm concerned about the contralateral anatomy, whether it be vascular anatomy or otherwise, on the far side of the disc space, then a lot of times I'll do that reduce or uh, release with just sequential uh, trials. And so I think that's important. I think the trial is much blunter than the cob. And uh, if I have anatomy I'm concerned about, then I'm not going to go through with the sharp cob. In the purpose of, of using the robotic yeah. assistance, we can actually navigate pretty much all of our disk space prep instruments that uh, we need to. I find that after I've established the trajectory with the cob, and otherwise I don't necessarily need to navigate these, I kind of look at my practice of which x-rays I would take if I was actually uh, doing the case under uh, fluoroscopic navigation intraoperatively. And uh, I don't typically get a lot of x-rays of me preparing the disk space, but uh, this particular platform allows us to navigate any of the disk space prep instruments that we would like. I typically do that by haptic feel, but for the purposes of, okay, of our to... demonstration, I'm gonna go ahead and use a push-pull or stirrup curette that I can again navigate into position here and clean out that disc space. Okay. And feeling myself okay. on the bone, again, I'm relying on the haptic feel as I'm working up against the undersurface of the L2 vertebral body. If you look at that image right there, it looks like I'm violating the surface. Mm -hmm. Keep in mind what I'm doing is mobilizing that L2-3 segment in relation to the L3 because we're navigating off the L3 vertebral body. And this allows me to reorient this tool. So there's two different positions here, the A position and now the C position. In the A position, it looked like it was moving up towards L2. In the C position, it's gonna be moving down towards the superior end plate of L3. And again, I can prepare that disc space. And then I'll just go ahead and use my pituitary and remove that disc material that I've just mobilized out of the disc space. And again, similar to the discussion we had about the standalone laterals, uh, I find it very important to uh, maintain the integrity of the end plates. So now we can navigate our trials, and I'm gonna start with a five millimeter trial. In this case, we're gonna place an expandable inner body, and uh, the height of my standard expandable inner body, and Dr. Davis, I'm gonna have you just tap, tap, tap here to start out. Good. And again, back to the idea of 
relying on the haptic feel, as soon as Dr. Davis got into the primary disc space, we could feel less resistance, and everything is checking out as far as my haptic so, feedback. So, Ronald, I'm going to ask another question. Yes, please. If you're using navigation and robotics, and uh, why are you Sorry. doing a trial, actually, for? Uh, to expand and mobilize the disk space. So you didn't do it with the cob, with the, all these other things? Uh, well, like I say, the insertion height of the expandable trial that I'm going to place in is eight millimeters. So if I have a severely collapsed disk space, then I can use my sequential dilation with the five millimeter. Now this is a seven millimeter trial. I'll usually move up to the nine millimeter trial to accommodate the eight millimeter height of the original, uh, or of the non-expanded uh, implant. Go ahead. I will, I will obviate all these steps, to be honest. So, no need. so this is the seven millimeter, and we're just going to go yes. to the implant mm -hmm. after this. But again, I find that using the trials to mobilize the segment yeah. uh, leads to me having to do less on the far side. And, and it, it's kind of a combination of uh, both Neil's approach to this and uh, Juan's approach to this. but. Uh, releasing that contralateral side. All right, and let's go ahead and place the final implant. So in this case, now we can navigate the final implant into place. These uh, implants are marked anterior and posterior, so you want to make sure that you've got appropriate bearings as you're inserting the implant. And again, I'm looking for the starting position by looking directly into the hole, and then I'm going to navigate it across the disk space using the robotic assistance or the interoperative navigation. And so again, we can see planned, and we're just trying to deliver it as close to that plan as possible, keeping in mind that's good, that the user interface uh, can be very compelling but inaccurate if you haven't done it correctly. We're going to use the expanding driver. So with the insertion tool, we can just insert the expanding driver, driver which is torque limited, into the device itself, keeping in mind that the torque limitation is set up for the mechanical failure of the expanding device, not the mechanical failure of bone. So if I know that someone is a relatively osteoporotic patient with low bone density, I may not expand it all the way to the torque limit of the expansion driver. Yeah. Roland, and, what, what are you seeing expanding? Can you see the expansion? No, you no. cannot see the expansion. So how much really you like want. Right, and well, that's, that's, again, if, if I wanted to see my expansion and decide how much I needed in this case, I'd bring fluoroscopy into the field. That's the limitation of uh, yeah, the no, interoperative the, the, so, Yeah, you the question know. is, uh, can you plan how much you're going to expand pre-op? You can. So if I know that the insertion height is 8 millimeters, and each rotation of the expansion driver expands to a certain degree of millimeters, so I can count my rotations. And if I sat there and said, okay, I need this to be 12 millimeters, then I can count my rotations and stop where it would be 12 millimeters before it torques out. Well, Roland, to be devil's advocate, you really don't know what happened. Nothing could have happened. It may never have expanded. Right, and Just that's where, again, I'm not... Click doesn't mean it expands. I'm not concerned about moving fluoroscopy in to see that expansion in these cases. And so that is, again, limitation of any navigation platform at this time. It's not going to show us the real-time expansion within the disk space. So maybe an argument for we don't need expandable cages then. Well, yeah, I mean... I mean, I, again, back to the idea that I can plan that space to be 12 millimeters beforehand. I can start with my 8 millimeter. I can turn the number of rotations necessary to know that I'm at 12 millimeters. Uh, again, I very seldom torque it out with the torque wrench. I just like people to understand that the torque wrench is not what the patient needs. The torque wrench is the mechanical failure of the expansion device. And so I find that I can actually plan these all quite well, dependent on what I need for the patient. That's awesome. Listen, uh, Ron, I know that's amazing what you show, and it's good for us because, uh, you know, we like to generate some questions, and yep. um, that's really nice. good. No, definitely, uh, we can see that it's feasible and you're making it work. We just, uh, you know how it is, we, we always are very curious and we're very um, challenging in terms of delivering good, you know, specifically, you know, with the, the complication that can happen around, but it looks pretty good. I mean, I think it's definitely, that's probably the way to go, you know. Um, there, and there is a shim system. To, it's, 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 it's not us, I think it's the technology that we don't have a real time information, you know. The day that the navigation will give us real time feedback, that yep. will be a 
bulletproof thing, you know? Um, that's why we, we, most of us, we use once in a while a shot here or there on the x-rays just to yeah. keep us on the real life, you know? So let me use a, a quick analogy and back to the idea that this is an important tool that we can use. And I agree that this tool doesn't answer all the questions. I'm uh -huh. sort of a weekend carpenter and build cabinets all the time. There's very few carpenters at this time that wouldn't use a table saw for the accuracy, the efficiency, and the reproducibility of reproducing parts of, say, a cabinet, et cetera. Um, so that's that part of that tool. Now, if we sat there and expected that same table saw to, to, to put the entire cabinet together, we'd be misunderstanding the use of that tool. So I agree 100%. Right now, there are limitations of this tool, and I would be able to love, I would love to be able to see all those things that we're addressing at this time as well. And I think in the future, our tools are going to be better, just yeah. like uh, people are developing better table saws all the time. But it's important to understand the limitation of the tool and not push the tool behind its limitations. And uh, so in these cases, again, I've got absolutely no problem bringing fluoroscopy into the field if necessary to see our degree of expansion, to make sure it matches up with what I had pre-planned yeah. for the patient, yeah. et cetera. But I find this a very powerful tool for the accuracy, yeah. efficiency, and reproducibility of placing my devices where I hope that they yeah. will go. No, definitely. Uh, to me, also, like an analogy is like, you know, planes can fly by, it, by its own 100%. So while we still have pilots and the cabin crew and this and that because, you know, it's just um, in case that the technology falls apart. So that's why I think the surgeons will be always there, carpenters will be always there, and um, we're just going to have more and more tools. But I think it looks pretty good, and I can tell you in five years we will be doing again this exercise and you will see how much difference is going to be, definitely. I mean, and, it, and it's, you know, you don't start doing it, who's going to do it, yeah? 100%. No, I agree. And I appreciate the opportunity to demonstrate it. Thank oh, you. That's, that's really uh, good, I, Ronald. Thank ask, you. Can I ask you a question? Please. Uh, so I know that for navigation, it's very important to keep the patient rigid, fixed, and not changing the anatomy, because if you change the anatomy, you need another uh, spin, right? Correct. Uh, after you do your first cage, you change the anatomy. Uh, yes. And you don't think that affects your second level? It can. I mean, uh, I, again, it gets back to the, the acceptance of, of what we're dealing with anatomy-wise. And um, I, I talked about the pedicle screws being a game of millimeters or fractions of a millimeter. If, for example, right now, after this demonstration, I was trying to do a right-sided L2 pedicle screw, I would be way too far off because I've changed the L2 relationship to the pelvis, right? Ah, okay. If I'm trying to work within the confines of what I need to successfully do an L3-4 inner body, I have not had any problems with delivering that L3-4 and then the L4-5 inner body uh, secondary to what I changed at L2-3. Thanks. Thank you. All right.